All right. Does the audio work? I, I take it you can all see this, right? All right, I'm going to talk about the future of aliens. That title was given to me. I don't know what the future of aliens is, but if they go to high school, their future might be a little bit brighter. I'm just going to try and provoke you with a few ideas here. There's not a whole lot of time. It says I have two minutes and seven seconds. That's not much. Um, this is the Allen Telescope Array. I know you can't see it, but you can go visit it, right? You just go on to I-5, drive for a couple of hours up I-5. That's a very interesting ride uh, and, until you get to to uh, almost the top of the state, make a right turn into the Cascade Mountains, and you can see these 42 antennas that we use every day to try and eavesdrop on signals from ET. Now, what I'm going to tell you today is why that not, might not be the best way to find cosmic company. How many of you think there is any cosmic company? How many of you are conscious? Okay, that's good. Let's see if this works. All right, this is... Oops, the history of intelligence, okay? Over on the left, you've got the first life. I don't know how many of you remember that. That was about four billion years ago. I remember it. And, you know, you get uh, single-celled critters for most of that time. The last 500 million years, Cambrian explosion, which was good news for Oxford. And then, you know, you got multicellular critters, trilobites, dinosaurs. Fortunately, they were wiped out. But they were only wiped out 66 million years ago. That's bad news, because had they been wiped out 166 million years ago, we would probably have the cure for death today. Okay, so there was a lot of time wasted on the dinosaurs. That's what we think we're looking for, the things at the end. And so we naturally assume they're somewhat like us. But it does mean that when we point those antennas, I tried to show you at the beginning, we point them in the directions of Earth-like planets, or where we think there are Earth-like planets. This is a, a, a drawing showing a couple of dozen Earth-like planets that have been found in the past 15 years. Uh, you can't see them, but they're not important. These are the things that we assume those planets have to have in order to cook up the Klingons or the Kardashians or whatever, all right? Okay, well, how many of those planets are out there? I showed you a couple of dozen. But in fact, what we've learned in the past really five years is that planets sort of like the Earth might be incredibly common. And in fact, one in six stars may have a planet sort of like the Earth. So that would mean that there are 50 billion or so cousins of Earth in our own galaxy. And if, by the way, our own galaxy is not good enough for you, there are two trillion other galaxies we can see. Well, the amount of time doubles. It's now four minutes. Okay. So that's a, lot of, that's a lot of places to look. But I'm telling you, I think maybe that's not the right thing. Here's a, well, never mind this, since you can't see, I won't tell you about it. Besides, you don't have a need to know, do you, about Trappist one? All right. Okay. So what would be behind the microphone if we were to find ET? That's really the, the, the thrust of this soporific presentation. Now, as I say, what we normally assume is they're on a planet with oceans and an atmosphere and all that stuff. So we assume that E.T. will look a little bit like us. And indeed, if you think of the aliens in the movies, sure, they've got big eyeballs and no hair, no, no clothes, no nicknames, no sense of humor. But basically, they're the same as you. All the aliens you see in the movies are the kind of critter that if they moved into your neighborhood, you know, you would probably talk about them with the neighbors a little bit, but then eventually you'd invite them over to the homeowners association meeting because they look like you. All right? Okay, well... Let's see if that's true. What's behind the microphone? These are the uh, things we normally assume, habitable planets and so forth and so on. But we also assume that they're more advanced than we are. And a lot of people object to that. They say, Seth, what are you talking about? They're more advanced than we are, right? Why couldn't they be less advanced than we are? Well, of course they could, right? It's just that you're not going to hear from those guys. If they're alien Neanderthals, I mean, they're doing their Neanderthal thing, but they're not broadcasting any signals into space that would tell you that they're there. So any we hear from are more advanced than we are. This is, by the way, what's wrong with all the sci-fi films where the aliens come to Earth to destroy Los Angeles, which, after all, from the point of view of San Francisco, is not such a bad deal. They come here to, to destroy Los Angeles, then we take them on with the Air Force and win. Never going to happen. <laughs> if they can come here, they're going to do whatever they want to do, right? And it may not be abducting you for 
breeding experiments that wouldn't be pleasant. More advanced than we are. So the usual approach to figuring out what the aliens are going to be like is to simply say, well, what are we going to be like in 10,000 years or 100,000 years or whatever? Now, people have thought about that. Here's a Nicolay Lam's prediction. This is people today, right? I mean, look around. That's kind of what they look like today. This is what he figures it'll look like in 20,000 AD. You may not see a whole lot of difference, but their foreheads are a little, little higher. Their eyeballs are a little bigger. You know, I, I suppose their thumbs are a little smaller. Okay. And this is what they'll look like 60,000 years from now. Right? No, nobody's white, nobody's black, everybody's in the middle. Eyeballs keep getting bigger, foreheads keep getting bigger. Right? And this is 100,000 years from now. Right? This, the eyes are really big because, you know, everybody's job is design websites or something like that. Okay, so they're all big. And by the way, I noticed that Hollywood hasn't escaped this prediction because you look at this, this person and they, they look pretty much like us too, the Navi. Okay, well, I think it's all too anthropocentric. I've already made that point about 12 times. The facts are that we like biology, right? All of this is based on biology. We like biology for the obvious reasons. And I think the National Science Foundation found that biology was the number one science for school kids. That's what they like the most, okay? But there are a lot of things about biology that aren't so good. It's complex. It's terribly complex. I mean, if you're looking for the cure for cancer, you begin to understand how complex biology is. And the reason is, it's bottom-up engineering, right? It's not like a car. Well, let's make a car. Okay, well, we could put two wheels on it, but then it might fall over. Three wheels, pretty good, but it's a redundant wheel. How about four wheels? Okay, that's it. It's designed from the top down, so it's relatively efficient, and you don't engineer things that you don't really need, you know, like the cigarette lighter or something. Okay. So it's very complex because of the bottom-up engineering. It's fragile, right? We barely work. Anybody over 30 in the audience, I don't think there is anybody, but if there's somebody over 30 in the audience, they know that we barely work. Uh, it takes forever to evolve into something better. You might think, okay, don't worry, our descendants are going to be smarter than we are. You can hope that for your kids, but it may not be true, right? I mean, we're no smarter than Julius Caesar was, and that was 2,000 years ago. Darwinian evolution is not about making things better, it's just, can you survive locally, right? Okay, and finally, we have short lifetimes. This is a really depressing point. Here's a, here's a plot, they say every time you show a plot, you lose 10% of the audience. I have, I have 12 plots. Okay, so what you see here is life expectancy, and it's plotted versus the number of heartbeats. The only lesson here is that our life expectancy is actually quite a bit longer than it should be, given, you know, what we are. And, uh, also, by the way, your life expectancy is longer if you have a lower heart rate. So if you can lower your heart rate to once per minute, right, then you might live, live longer. Okay, but this is a problem. If you're going to, you know, be the descendants of us, if you're going to go into space, the fact that you live for 100 years at best isn't good enough, okay? Well, here's the solution. Nothing new here. You've heard it about 20 times today, I suspect. This is a plot by Hans Morvich from 1988. He's a roboticist at Carnegie Mellon. And what he's showing here is the speed of the fastest computers. Now, what you can't see is that, of course, it's getting, they're getting faster exponentially, a heavily overworked word these days. By 2020, your laptop will have the, make it 2025, your laptop will have the same compute power as a human brain, by 2040, your laptop will have the same compute power as all human brains put together. Okay, and you might wonder, what does that mean? Are they going to take over? I don't know what it means. My personal view is that I'm just going to turn the laptop around. You type. I don't know. But you, you know this story. We're inventing our successors. Okay, uh, so here you see a human brain. And for those of you into the computer biz, you know what this means. 30 billion MIPS. So 30 billion million instructions per second is kind of the speed at which a human brain goes, the equivalent. But here's a computer in China, the Tianhe 2, that beats out your brain already. Now, mind you, it takes a lot more space, and you can't feed it hamburgers, but what's happening here should be obvious. We're inventing our successors, and as soon as you do that, you ask those machines to design their successors. Then there's no limit, right? In this century, we will have thinking machines that can outthink all humans put together. Now, they're not going to necessarily stay in the planet where they're born. Why should they? I mean, you may think this is a great place, but that's because you've been brainwashed 
by, you know, by, <laughs> by San Francisco. It's not the greatest part of the universe, right? Where you want to go is where there's more energy, more action, something, but not here. I mean, some will stay here just, you know, to treat you like they're pets or uh, who knows what. But, in fact, most of them will get up and go to other places where there are other things. So E.T. is not going to be these guys, right? I mean, this is what we assume, these, these aliens. It's going to be, you know, these guys. It's going to be some sort of synthetic intelligence. And that affects SETI in a very serious way because we keep looking for our analogs in space. It's like asking T-Rex, if you come across T-Rex, asking T-Rex, hey, uh, T, well, what do you think the aliens are going to look like? And I'm sure that the dinosaurs, if they could talk at all, would say, you know, they're going to be really small at one end and big in the middle and small at the other end. In other words, they're going to be dinosaurs, right? Not right. I mean, it's not going to be like this. So can we do anything better to, uh, to improve the search? You know, how would we find these guys? And uh, in the few minutes remaining, I'll throw out some ideas that are worth about as much effort as I'm putting into them, okay? First, you need to ask, if you have thinking machines, you know, out in space, after all, there's been four and a half billion years here on Earth for us to get this far, but there's been three times that amount of time for the universe to cook up these guys and fill space with these thinking machines. What would they want to do? I think that's a very difficult question to answer. It's sort of, sort of like saying, you know, having your gut biome decide what your, you know, what humans are going to do, what your brain wants to do. It doesn't know, and there's no way it can know. But here are three things that appeal to me. Entertainment, maybe ancestor simulations, that question was asked here today. Information, getting, just gathering information, maybe they like to learn, right, hoping it'll improve their career down the line. Or maybe just changing the universe, because the universe is beginning to go away. All right, so here's the first one, entertainment. I mean, would this get boring after, you know, a gazillion years of playing free cell for a machine? I don't know, but it'll probably play that number of games, you know, inside of one second and then it's bored. So that's one thing. The other thing is the alien simula sorry, the ancestors simulations. You know, Nick Bostrom, seen here or not seen here, uh, a professor of philosophy at Oxford, says there's a 20% chance that what you're experiencing here is not real. This is just software running in a future computer. I, I asked Bostrom, I asked Bostrom whether they said, so if that's true, Nick, do I have to lead a good life, a moral existence, or can I just have fun? I mean, if it's only software, who cares? And he stopped for about 10 seconds, and he said, well, I don't know, Seth, maybe you should lead a moral existence. I don't know why he said that. Maybe his wife was listening. I don't know. Okay, so that, th these are the kind of things that maybe, maybe those machines would do. It seems all kind of pointless, but maybe they don't have anything else to do. Maybe they'll build, you know, big, big society, cities, who knows what. But there is the fact, whoops, there is this fact, and I think it's an important fact, and that is that they're not going to be homogeneous. It's not going to be super brains over here and an equivalent super brain over there. They will be completely different or they will be substantially different. And the reason is, in order for them to be the same, they have to exchange information. Otherwise, this guy got started a billion years before that guy and this guy will never catch up unless he can learn from that guy. Okay? But the time to send information across the cosmos is very long compared to the time it requires to improve yourself. So I think that, that that won't be the case. There'll be inhomogeneities in the distribution of intelligence, and that suggests that our best hope is to, uh, <laughs> is to look for you know, the, the, the squeaky wheels, look for the really super smart guys, because maybe they're making more noise. Here's just a suggestion. You have a, you know, a gal galaxy over here and a galaxy over there. Maybe all the uh, machines are in the centers of the galaxies where there are big black holes, lots of energy, and we're in the middle somewhere. So if we're in the middle, then we might be able to point our antennas in the directions of these galaxies that line up on either side of us and maybe find something. Okay, uh, places to look. There are other places to look hot stars, stuff like that. Places where there's a lot of energy, they'll need that. The other things to look for are garbage. The machines may make certain kinds of garbage, mostly waste heat. We don't really have the technology to find that if it's very localized, but that's something we can do in the future. Okay, well, let me just say one last thing. One problem that any machine that can last for billions of years, self-repair, self-improve, is going to confront is the fact that the universe is in fact going away slowly. 
right? It's expanding. That makes it harder to go into Andromeda this weekend because, you know, every second that you sit here, Andromeda gets another 60 miles farther away. That's a problem. But the, re the, the, the real problem is that the universe is not only expanding, but it's dying. The stars are going out, and in about 10 to the 100th years, which is a big number, it's a Google, 10 to the 100th years, there won't be enough energy anywhere in the universe to roast a marshmallow. The last black hole will have evaporated. The stars are long dead. The machines may figure that out, and maybe then just trying to understand the universe, maybe they'll try to change it. And if they try to change in the universe, or have had tried to change it, maybe we can find that. Okay, thanks very much.